called Gareth Boitaho. Uh, I'm, I'm here to represent today. I'm feeling pretty humbled actually, to be honest. I'll go straight through um, the introductions and just start talking with things. Um, I work for Te Whareua Nango Awanui Arangi. Um, as a, I have been a kaiako in the past teacher in the realm of Te Ahu Taiao in the Environmental Studies Programme. And so I've been there for the past four years. Um, so that's the reason why I've been asked to come here, given that my involvement within that education of um, environmental studies and the connection that Maramataka has within the world of Mātauranga Māori. Um, pretty humbled to be standing up here um, amongst all of these rangatira of Mātauranga Māori, um, being a Pākehā myself. I'm from Hamilton originally, I now reside in Murupara. I um, have always been a, an interested person with regards to nature and being out in the outdoors, mahina kai, growing kai. Um, and so through that, I've always had an interest in the environment and that type of world. Um, my major interest, although my mahi is at Te Whareua Nango Awanui Arangi, is in um, developing the little piece of whenua that my wife and I uh, reside on near Murupara into from what was formerly a bit of grazing land, um, pretty unproductive and dealt with, just like most of this country is, in a pretty um, unruling way. We moved there about 10 years ago and we got into a um, process of doing the normal thing. We got some cows, some sheep, all these different animals to put onto our little block of land. And then I started going through the stresses of what farmers go through all the time and learning that whole process of mahi whenua. Um, and started to realise, man, a lot of these things we're doing, not only have I learnt it through the process of environmental studies, but they're completely flawed. They require a huge amount of energy to be put into them, and what you get out of them in the end isn't really that much. And so, um, the reason I went to Murupara, how I originally ended up there, um, was through working for Department of Conservation. So I spent about eight years working in DOC, um, and I was a trainee ranger at first at Murupara, working in the Whirinaki Forest. And then I went on to becoming um, the person who um, monitored the biodiversity outcomes of all of the work that was done up in that forest and other forests around nearby. And so got a good understanding of the processes that happen for management and then the outcomes of those processes. And after eight years, I left thinking, wow, what's gone wrong with this place? I always wanted to be a ranger. Now I don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, that was to do with internal politics, but also to do with a lot of the management techniques that were very Western overarching sort of style and based around kill, 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 because we've got to save, save, save. Um, so after that, I went through a big change in life, obviously, because I walked out of that whole world view and stepped into another one. And now um, weeds and pests are free to roam on my place. And in that process, they're growing lots of kai for me as well. And, um, and they're rongwa. So that's sort of a lot of the background of where I come from. So through, although I've got that, um, interest in that side of things and through the education system environmental studies I just like the rest of us in here am dependent on the economic system dependent on fossil fuels and all of these things that drive our world today so we're in a bit of a different situation here in Te Ao Hurihuri. Um so yeah I had a slide oh there's something maybe coming up but it doesn't really um, affect too much the reason I put the slideshow here was to support my um, not going off on too much of a tangent throughout the way. An amateur's perspective of the Maramataka. I'm Pākehā, my parents are Pākehā obviously because I am, um, and that's I've come through that way. So I've never been brought up in the world of Mātauranga Māori. Although I grew up in a part of Hamilton that was um, on, the, in one of the, on the edge of one of the Pōhara districts, and so a lot of my friends growing up were Māori, Islanders, and from all over different um, aspects of the world, I had a real um, connection through friendship, but not beyond that point. I didn't have any understanding of Mātauranga Māori. It wasn't until I went to university, got out of the education system and was studying an environmental studies degree, uh, science degree at Waikato University in environmental studies, that I learned about the reality of te tiriti and, and the issues that are going on in this country to cause the situation that we have today. Um, so yeah, hence it's an amateur's perspective. That's me, we're moving on. That's the view from my place. That's our bit of weedy land that I'm operating on, growing fuel, fibre, and kai. And for the purpose of manaakitana, 
with a hope one day that it could actually pay a bill, um, but there's no real great intention with that. <laughs> My wife um, runs our little cafe at Murupara, um, so if you're ever stopping out, feel free to go get a nice cup of coffee and nice kai. Some of the kai there will come from this land, especially anything with eggs in it, because our main product at the moment is eggs, because we're overrun with birds. Um, in the event that they all disappear from the bush, we've got some to put back there. Um, okay, so throughout my mahi, I teach um, normally within papers like ecology, focus papers within the environmental studies degree. Our degree that we've been teaching in is currently gone and in the process of redevelopment so that they can bring back a better option. One of the um, parts of that that's um, being proposed is that there's a specific papers focused on maramataka and astrology and seasons in order to be able to bring that through. So that's something I've been really pushing that's a really important part of it. So watch that space. Um, so how maramataka has been introduced in the past and how I've delivered it through um, the environmental studies papers is really through a curriculum. So that curriculum was written down by one person at one point in time in their place in a contract under the Western system. Okay, so it's a how it's delivered is under that sort of guise, I suppose. So we focus on Mātauranga Māori and science combining in order to um, move ourselves forward with, in the best of both worlds sort of thing. What I've found is that they're two different systems. You can use science to verify Mātauranga Māori, but why? It's been verified over a thousand years, the science is already done. So it's a different form of science. So the word Western science is something that I try to avoid completely because it's not. Science is actually just a process of recording, measuring, analysing and then presenting it. And so maramataka is the output of science. Um, so yeah, I think what maramataka has the potential to do though is to validate science and maturanga Māori in general. So what we've got is um, throughout New Zealand history we've got huge amounts of numerical Western data sets that are based around temporal um, differences, so t changes in time. Maramataka has the potential to be able to make sense of some of the senseless stuff that's been created over time just by gathering data sets, working out what day things were happening and whether it was worth time. So one of the big things I found when I started learning about maramataka was in DOC, we go out and we measure, we'll do things like bird counts, and a bird count, like for Kiwi, at night time, can you imagine, given an understanding, everyone's got a bit of an understanding of maramataka here, could you imagine that that could be variable depending on which night we went out? So Kiwi counts never ever take into account maramataka. They only take into account the Gregorian week because it fits to a timetable when everyone's available, when we can schedule things to be together. And we're not in maramataka to be able to schedule that at the moment. The future, the moi moi are, the potential is that um, we could. And so one of my dreams that think that's becoming more obvious is that they're looking at it, treat, treating it as a core subject within the environmental studies. I think that's a really good way to um, introduce it and bring some depth to maramataka and the various different components of maramataka. Um, but the real dream is that we could actually schedule our entire degree based around maramataka, not based around the Gregorian calendar. And that's difficult. <laughs> because everyone's got their things they do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, so um, trying to fit certain things to work with that isn't always easy. And so you can imagine the dangers when we understand that Fiddle is connected to the personification of evil, our, um, one of the children that was associated with some of those issues and, and um, instances in the world. So if we get Fiddle coming in on a Thursday night when everyone's getting paid and off to the pub, Imagine what sort of night that's going to be. Um, if we've got federal coming in for the boxing fight night or something, could be a dangerous sort of situation. So, and you might not want to be there. So being able to arrange ourselves and schedule ourselves relative to maramataka and make the Gregorian calendar fit would be a wonderful way forward. Um, so yeah, what is maramataka? It's just another form of a measure of time. Um, there's no maramataka, it's na maramataka. And our maramataka in Aotearoa, if you look into the research, are very close to all of the maramataka around the Pacific. And then I'd say if you, look, if you were researching that type of um, connection back further, you'll find that maramataka and words and connections go right back to 
Asia, South America, and the different connections that were happening throughout all the um, constant migration that was going over a long period of time. Um, so the reason for it is to separate parts of the day and night, and it's based around our lifestyles now as to why we have a measure of time. And that's, that's what I found out about the whole thing. Um, back in the days, our day was dealt with by hunting, mahina kai, gathering food, rongoa, and so the times of day didn't really fit to a clock, they fitted to when times that worked best. So if you look at our current um, measure of time, it's universal time. So what it is, it means we've come into this global situation now and we've tried to figure out a way that we can measure it versus each other. But it's not a perfect scale by any means, that's why we have leap years. Because it doesn't, there's no such thing, and, and the world is very dynamic, there's no way that we constantly can measure things in a linear scale, so we have to fix it up every now and then. And that's one of the reasons why people struggle with maramataka, is because you have to constantly recalibrate yourself as you're moving along. Um, so traditional timescales were based more like, um, this, my learning of timescales of Māori timescales, so throughout teaching and environmental studies, I haven't had any real, um, I haven't delved into that concept at all actually, but my learnings go back to when I did Te Arareo at um, Te Wānanga Aotearoa here, and that was in the um, division of Te Ata, through the various stages of the utter. Now, none of us have even woken up most of the time before we've got through the utter and we're into the middle of the utter and we've missed out on all of those times a day. Um, and divisions of the fact that various, the whole middle of the day doesn't matter whether it's 11 or three o'clock, same things are happening at that time, they don't change. So we don't need to be so specific to a linear scale necessarily to fit within maramataka. And that's the, the reason why maramataka as a form of timing has fallen out is because it's very difficult to create a linear scale and if we look at our um, maramataka from um, Hokianga that um, Papa Maru passed on there, we can see that it's a very complex form of um, time and separating that um, phase of time. Not something that can just be written down and you can measure in numbers to numbers. So it's caused by life in general, and everything that goes on in this world is affected by cycles and pulses, and this is what the maramataka is all about. So the sun, as we know, is part of a galaxy and solar system that's um, centre of a solar system, part of a galaxy, it's cycling, moving around. The moon moves around the planet, it's the biggest thing connected to our Earth other than the planets that are further away. Um, planets are all moving, stars are all moving, and through those cycles, we're cycling energy, nutrients, life, and minerals. So everything natural is affected by the maramataka. We've got a big issue in the modern day, though, in that we have this concept of technology. And that's where we become the god because they're the things that we've created. And so these are the self-sustaining little systems, but they're separate to nature. And even if we talk about solar power or digging up fossil fuels, they separate from nature. When certain things happen, those cycles and pulses stop, like the battery runs flat or the sun goes out on a solar panel or whatever it might be. So they're not part of the natural system. So technology fits with watches and clocks and all those sorts of things, phones. We all know what time it is most of the time these days. Even when I was a kid, we didn't know what time it was most of the time. But now everyone does because we've got phones and all of these different um, things that go with us and keeping us knowing what the time is. Um, so yeah, nature is driven by external cycles and pulses, and that's all natural matter, living or non-living. Internal cycles are governed by external cycles, so our pulses and all our different things going on by us are uh, purely governed by all of those different spinnings and effects of rotation and connection to other um, celestial <coughs> masses, you could say. So Modi is a pretty real thing in that Modi is the existence of life within non-living, living things and that connection. And so, um, maramataka gives mana to the Modi. Um, technologies driven by fossil fuels, whether it's the renewable or non-renewable, the hydro dam on the river that's um, providing electricity wouldn't exist without fossil fuels. The solar panel that um, the greenie gets so that he can get, be off the grid and be independent of all those um, bad pressures on the earth was made with things that came from mining. It's all dependent on fossil fuels. Um, we're in a transport situation here. I drove this morning 60 kilometers to come here. Did it in less than an hour. If um, this was a traditional maramataka wānanga, it I would have come here a couple of days ago, started my journey. I wouldn't be home till next week. 
So life's changed, and our whole systems have changed. We're into our huri huri now. Um, so a major thing that technology removes is that technology is part of the globe, and it's part of that global citizenship, whereas maramataka fits as um, has been said already within the local sense. So it's that whole concept of connection to a place, and that's the most beautiful thing I've found with my learnings with maramataka. So, on to my big long, excuse my um, slides here, I didn't actually, the funny thing is I'm going anti-technology, but I'm using all the technology to um, support it. That's the reality, we're all bound and we're all slaves to that system, I suppose you could say. So, um, how we act within that is probably the way that we can create change, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I've got an interest in natural gardening, I hate fertilisers, pesticides, herbicides, don't like 1080, um, I see that we should be dealing with these things in a more holistic um, way and that we need to be thinking about the realities of why our bush is in the state it's in isn't because of the pests, it's because there's only 20% left and that 20% is all up on top of the mountains where the least fertility is. All of our fertile stuff is now farmland or has been converted into something else. It's not available for Rongwa to grow anymore, not available to create that bush edge. So the weeds grow because they're better at it. Um, Weeds are really good for helping start the native tune. If you want to grow native trees, the best thing to do, leave the weeds there, plant them in amongst them. Um, so yeah, my first attempts with maramataka um, and lunar calendars specifically, so being in natural gardening, if anyone's read an organic gardening magazine or anything to do with that, you'll see organic uh, moon calendars, lunar calendars. I used to follow those and they never made sense to me. Never work, plant your garlic on this day. And then I'd um, pick up the next magazine and it'd be different. That didn't make sense either. And so I started to think, well, what's the thing? I knew of maramataka, so I started to learn maramataka um, because of that contradiction. Technology has really helped me through that, so it has its place. The RASNZ, which is the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand, presents um, very well calculated based on very correct and, and deep mathematics to get that calculation of when the peak of the various quarter phases of the moon are. And it's free, you can just go online and find that. Um, R-A-S-N-Z dot, just Google R-A-S-N-Z. I always type in lunar phases into my um, Google document and it comes up straight away. Um, or Google browser, should I say. So through that you can calibrate yourself quite well to the quarters if you know where your quarters lie within your maramataka. And your maramataka or your Maramataka o te rohe is really important because, and the reason why it's so connected to a place is where we are, if I go right back to the start, our marama, I think, rises over Paiwhakataratara at home. So because of that, that Paiwhakataratara is about a thousand metres high and it's only about 10 k's away from home and we're at about 200 metres above sea level. So we can't see the eastern horizon. So where the moon rises is quite different. So um, every place has its different connection to the powers of it based on its perspective in the world. That's why it's so specific to a place. And with gardening, that's extremely important. With mahina kai, it gets a little less important because we spread ourselves a bit further. So then you'll find that the fishing calendars, the hunting calendars tend to be a bit more general and the gardening calendars tend to get very specific to the place um, because of those influences. Um, so yeah, so my maramataka, the original source is unknown, I initially came about learning about maramataka through reading Paul Moon's book on um, Hohepa Kereopa down in the Waimana, and I figured well, uh, in those, the, was he in Waimana or Ruatuki? Someone can help me there, Waimana, thank you. So Waimana and Ruatuki, both of those valleys there are very similar to our valley in that they point straight north, and, so that, and they've got hills on either side. So we've got pretty similar perspectives in the world and we're very close within a few kilometres, like within tens of kilometres of each other in a straight line. So I thought, well, that's a really good way to start. And since then I've followed and I've asked around in our part of the world and I've never found an openly available maramataka for Ngāti Manu or Ngāti Whare, our local um, hapu around our area. Um, and so I got that one from that book, and then I also went online and looked at different, and then I found, whoa, there's a whole load of contradiction here, there's um, dozens and dozens of maramataka. So I found one that fitted most with the variations within the book, and started working on it, started using it, living by it, and trying to see how it went. And the way that I learnt the days, I've had people ask me, how could you possibly learn 30 days? 
um, just the same way as we could learn 30 people's names or 30 types of food or 30 fruit or 30 trees or whatever it might be. It's simple. You just got to practice and you got to do it. So you can't expect someone to tell you and you'll remember it. You got to take that into your own to go through that process, work with people, wānanga, and repetition is the only way you can do it. Um, so the way I did it, I put it up. We've got a calendar in our whareapaku. I put the names of the months next to it and I lent them. And I worked out, I put onto that calendar the um, moon phases, drew them on of when they came and what time. And from that point I started learning every day. Obviously it's a place you go every day. And so it was one of those moments of forcing myself. That's never actually left that place and it's kind of random because it's been there for quite a few years now. But it's a um, kaiaho. That was my way of learning, of getting those things. Okay. So one of the issues with maramataka, it's, a syst it's, it's central to a system of beliefs. So a worldview specific to the people that developed it. And part of a worldview is um, not correct. It's got to be the whole worldview. It's a holistic thing. So um, maramataka, rongoa, kai, mahi na kai, everything goes together. And then through that comes manakitana and all of the um, whanaungatanga and concepts that come through that. So... Um, one of the massive issues there is the belief system. We all have this, um, well, from my personal perspective, I'm Parker obviously, but I try to operate within the Māori worldview of the world is around me, not me being the centre of the world. So that's a really important thing, that's that selfish problem and all that sort of thing coming through again, that we need to all overcome. Um, yeah, so that creates problems for us because we always are pressed with different issues that cause us to question our own activities possibly. And um, Well, I find that for me anyway. I can't speak on behalf of everyone. Um, maramataka with regards to calibration, one of the biggest things that fixed it from not quite making sense to making sense for me was that te pō comes before te ao. We all know this through the stories of creation, whether it be Pākehā creation stories or Māori creation stories, night come before day. The day does not start at midnight, the day starts at sunset. So that's when the new day begins, starts with the poor, comes through to the day. Once you get that sussed, it kind of helps to get those names right and how the things work with them. And it's really important because when you get into dangerous points of the month, like where Oronga Nui leads into Mutu Whenua, on my calendar that I follow, um, if you get it wrong, you're stepping from a really good time into a really bad time and you could be acting in a way that's dangerous for that um, time of month. So that was a really good thing. The other way I calibrate personally is on tamatea and tangaro. Tamatea ayo, the day that I have, the third day of tamatea, is the first quarter of the moon. And it's really difficult to tell when the moon is new because you can't see it. It's really difficult to tell when the moon is full because from an extremely full moon to an almost full moon is quite different, uh, quite similar, should I say. But it's really easy to tell when it's a quarter moon because it's a perfectly straight line up and down or normally on an angle like that. Um, so that's the calibration time. Go onto that RASN website and you've got every fortnight you're calibrated, even if you're going out a little bit with your maramataka. And you'll find that when you're practicing, you do get lost in time. And that whole concept of you don't know what time it is, no one knows what time it is. Um, so yeah. So I got into using, because I, be, I used to be a hard out trout fisherman. And one of the things when I first started getting into it was asking a friend of mine and he said, nah, doesn't work on Parker things. Uh, I won't say that word in this place, but it's wrong. That's completely incorrect. We're all part of nature. We're all bound by natural cycles. We're all affected by the moon, the sun, the stars. Um, so it was perfect for trout. It's just that the days that work for tuna don't work for trout because they've got different habits. <coughs> Simple as that. So you need to make a maramataka for each individual mahi nakai. Um, but mahinakai is the ultimate way to get involved with maramataka because the result is real time. If you go out, you can test it by your hunt or your catch or whatever it might be, whether you were fitting within what you were thinking of with the maramataka or not. Um, gardening was the next, next phase of bringing it on, and that's the one that, game, that sort of changed the game for me. Last summer, I watered my garden about 10 times. Even though we had a pretty wet summer, we live in a drought zone. And the reason I watered my garden about 10 times was because I didn't need to water it any other time. Because of planting days fitting with the moon phase in order to support the right cycles of how the plants work. And so every year I'm working to try and water my garden less and less and still produce kai to a, um, and an abundance that I can give some away. Um, helps with planning and maintenance. 
No point worrying about getting out into your garden on certain days, so you may as well sleep in, have a rest, or whatever it might be. Um, but certain times, like as that um, tamatea phase, uh, as the tangaroa phase comes in, and as the tiria, um, that moon comes on, you've got about a week from each of those points where you can go hard and get heaps of stuff done and you'll have great success with it. So it's really cool for the pot concept of planning and what you're going to have coming up. And you don't need to get stressed out with, oh, I haven't done this or that. You don't need to do it on that day. You just leave it. You say, when you become more in touch with the natural cycles, I think you become less bound to that time, to the Gregorian calendar, all those sorts of things. Gregor, I think, I don't know, does anyone know the history of, I keep meaning to look that up and find out where um, Gregor come from, but I assume he was, um, does anyone in the room know before I go on? Ancient Roman times. Roman, yeah, I was going to say, I thought he was Greek or Roman, but he developed that process of um, measuring time. Um, so, sports routine, and it supports wise planning of coming interactions. If you've got an important meeting with your boss that you don't know what it's about and it's due on fedor, call in sick. Don't turn up, okay? If you've got a potential to have a business deal with someone and they've called you on Oronganui, get into it. If someone calls and says, oh, we've got a maramataka um, wānanga coming up, I'd like you to come talk, and I think, oh, my goodness, there's no way I could do it, but he called on Rako Nui. Oh, well, there's no reason why I shouldn't, should say no, this is the right day to say yes. And then the maramataka wānanga falls on Ōhua. Perfect. All's going to work. It's going to be a fruitful day. We'll all learn from it. Um... Yep, and so also the biggest thing that I've found with maramataka, and this is massive because it goes way beyond fishing, gardening, all that stuff, but it's really important in natural cycles, is the emotional well-being, personal health and safety. Not from like the HSE thinking, from the karakia and <coughs> spiritual health and safety. That correct interaction for the correct day. So yeah, if you're having a raru with someone in your family, don't try and make up on fiddle. <laughs> it ain't going to work. It's only going to get worse, you know. But it's true, I found this, and I grew up in a world um, where star signs and horoscopes were um, airy fairy stuff, kind of crazy. I was amazed to see um, the other day when I was doing a bit of research and looked on a major Māori fisheries organisation's website that um, they had a newsletter that presented the horoscopes in it but didn't mention Maramataka. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I won't say who. <laughs> but anyway, that blew my mind that that could be possible. The other thing that I've found that's really useful is for memory of relative time dates. Remember when you'd say to someone, oh, you know, it was last, was it last Thursday or was it the Thursday before? Or was it, you know, and so you start trying to figure out and remember time. What I've found is that maramataka is really easy because you know the day. You have a personal connection to each of those names of the day once you get to know them. And whether it's right for you or um, it, uh, whether it's incorrect for others, if it's right for you, you can carry on to work with that. So. I know now with my garden, I never record anything. I've thrown away the diaries years ago. Um, never label any plants that I grow because over time you need to be part of it and you get to know all these things. It's pointless. I wouldn't walk up to my friends and give them a um, I am so-and-so label when they come into my house just so that I can remember what their name is. I know where they are. You don't need that. So it's really cool for helping with recall of memory of past events. The reason for it, you got 12 to 13, 28 to 30 day cycles within a year versus 52 seven day cycles in a year. It's hard to remember 52 things, but it's easy enough to remember a dozen. Okay, so what also I found, problems and barriers with maramataka, they require that commitment to an alternative belief system that is actually quite conflicting <laughs> with our modern day global belief system that we all have. You can call it Western or whatever, but it's actually a global belief system now of Money drives the world, we've got to fit within that money world. Our mahina kai is not mahina kai anymore, it's mahina money in order to use that to buy kai. <laughs> um, so, other problem, variable time scale, requires that constant calibration to know the time. But the most important thing is it requires observation. And most of us now, as soon as the sun sets, are in front of screens, watching someone else's story somewhere else in the world. Not outside looking at the moon, especially at this time of year. But if we were in the old days, we'd all be huddled around a fire at the moment outside and we'd all see the moon. And we'd all be perfectly in touch with the moon because we know it's just part of your world. But now it's not part of our world because we live inside. So a very important thing I'd recommend to people is if you're into maramataka, start looking for the moon. And then you'll get to know 
Like now you'd never know, uh, now you would never look at this very time for a moon. Because there's no moon now. The moon went down in the middle of the night, early hours of the morning. Yeah. Certain times of the um, month you'll be looking at the very day, break of dawn like you're looking for Matariki. Other times of the month you'll be looking at the very, just after sunset because it's the only moment of the day you'll find it. So as you get to watch the moon, you get to know when you're looking for the moon, where the moon is, where it should be. And then you'll also know that if it's a certain type of cloud, no point looking for the moon because it'll all go out in a wee while. So the other, other um, problem is that variable spatial system. And I guess that's one of the reasons why Maramataka got disregarded is because there's no one Maramataka. So you've got to understand it relative to your place. And you couldn't present on the national news about what's happening to the, relative to the Maramataka because you'd have to have about 50 different sets of Maramataka information every night and there wouldn't be time within the news time to fit that. <coughs> yeah, so there's no watches or clocks that fit to that time scale. There's no linear time scale that fits the Maramataka. Therefore, you need to have that observational cal calibration and you can have times where you could be, have a cloudy period during Tangaroa or Tamatea and therefore you're out for a month, potentially. So it's all about that constant calibration to ensure you don't get out for too long as well. So it's a, um, that holistic concept once again. Um, the confusion to fitting to the Gregorian routine, so our jobs nowadays tend to be, and, and timing of things tends to be based to a clock scale. Maramataka gives you that problem when things fall on days where they coincide with other um, concepts in your mind. And then one of the problems, we're all stuck inside, we lose touch with Maramataka um, and all natural cycles because of the fact that we're disconnected from it. We're not even touching the ground in here, you know. Um, and this is a special whare connected to a very special place that's purely about connecting to the whenua. But within the space, we've, most of us have got shoes on, got rubber soles between us, plus um, manufactured materials protecting us from Papa Tuanuku. And that's kind of an easy way to lose touch of nature. So I'm one of those people that when I start, get stuck in that realm, I take my shoes off and I go walk around in the yard for a while and just let my feet connect to the ground, which I've read things that kind of has a whole lot of um, valid reason behind it. But personally, I think it definitely is um, a very good idea if you're feeling a bit out of touch with nature, just take your shoes off and go for a walk or lie down on the ground or something like that. Um, it has issues with conflicting worldviews, belief systems, and it can incite prejudice by talking about Maramataka. So I've had some personal situations where I've talked to other Pākehā people and ended up in massive um, disagreements with them and, and total disrespect for those people because of the racism that comes out behind underlying the differences between Maramataka. Um, and so that's, you know, that creates a bit of a problem being a Pākehā trying to tell people about this amazing knowledge system when you just get, I mean, you guys know what it's like to get shot down on um, the concept of something that's so dear to your heart to be disregarded by society. Um, yeah. And then one of the other dangers with the maramataka is the advantage. So as um, Pam Gowans mentioned this morning, We've got a situation now where our bush and our natural resources aren't quite in the state that they once were with regards to mahina kai. So we've got a limited resource now compared to the potential of um, what it once was and what people may expect from it. So people with knowledge of maramataka that's been passed and well understood have the potential to utilize, take that outside of that Māori worldview and outside of the concepts of manaakitana, whanaungatana and supporting other people and use it to benefit themselves. So it's a danger, that's one of the dangers with maramataka and who you share that information with. But the potential is huge so it can in increase our understanding of natural cycles and pulses and why things operate in the way they are. Science is forever trying to understand this stuff and it'll forever keep trying because it completely removes itself from those natural cycles in, gen in most um, situations. Old knowledge, observation over time, that's what helps us understand these cycles and pulses. Um, it can help us maximise efficiency of time. Don't waste time doing things on days when they don't matter. Have a holiday. Go out and do them on the days when they do matter. And one of the problems in the world today is everyone's working so much to be able to fund that house or whatever it is that we're working towards that um, people just break down 
because they've lost touch and um, get into that world. And it's only if you remove yourself, become radical or whatever it might get treated as, that you um, have an opportunity to work within those types of systems. It can help us with sustainable resource use because it can enforce Rahui times based on you don't take on this day, you don't touch things on those days, and that can support good management of the natural resources that are affected by those natural cycles. <coughs> it can help us with res resilience to issues of climate change, peak oil, etc. Because when we had it recently out our way, you guys might have heard anyone who's connected to the communities of Tiurawera would know 12 weeks with no road, and people had to drive an extra 40 kilometres each way to get in and out. And when you're on the um, benefit or you've got a very low income based on a subsistence living of killing the few possums that are left in the Uruweta, um, that extra 40k is impossible. So therefore you're suddenly isolated. And it was only a couple of decades ago that everyone up there was isolated and lived purely within their realm anyway. But now that we've all become addicted to oil and the use of oil to transport us in our cities and everything's been planned and developed in a way that supports that, they were cut off, lots of people were cut off for 12 weeks. So um, one of my next venture at Mahi is to switch and um, because our environmental studies isn't working anymore, I'm about to move into the realm of teaching a kaioranga program, certificate in growing healthy um, kaioranga for the purpose of fulfilling people's obligations to the world, I suppose. So that's gonna be really cool because up there, everyone was gutted they had no garden this year, yeah. And um, it was a real situation where people were actually struggling for food. Um, the other thing it can do, it can help us collect quality environmental data collection instead of budget stuff like Doc collects now and never reports on because it doesn't actually tell them anything. Um, it can help the well-being of our soul and spirit by understanding why we feel down on that day or why we're ready to go on that day and working with it. And it can help us maintain that connection to knowledge of the past and build on that connection of knowledge to the past to assist in an uncertain future. So I'd say everyone in here must have an interest because you're here. We've got two maramataka now. The one I follow is the reason I bought this up is it's identical to this. Um, works for me in my place. Find one. Best way is to work with your whanau to find out who has one first. And then if that doesn't work, just a degree of separation from there. But do it, get it, use it, understand it, work with it. Kia ora tātou. Text emails for people? Because yeah, let Jade know because it's on his computer, so he no problem. Oh, and are you doing your thing at Aunui? Kaoranga certificate? Yeah. Yeah, it's through Te Parawananga Aunui but we're teaching it at Te Whaiti. Yeah, so it's going to be on on location, and it's going to be through the kura there, um, but with adult students, obviously. Kura. Probably a good point. Nice to meet you, brother. I don't want to actually work with you, but I've been so flat out when you haven't even met. Oh, kia ora. <laughs> uh, I don't know, half of my organisation. Uh, my name is Krishna, and uh, yeah, it's just beautiful to have that perspective from a Pākehā perspective, and we're all learning that. We're all Pākehā, we're all Māori, whatever that means. It's about a whole redefining all of these tikapa, all these concepts, 
and uh, so thank you for that big wake up call. It's wonderful, isn't it? Um, also, just another advert, some great um, commercial break here. And, uh, I, just to add, I just want to add to the advertising here for, um, for Kaiorama to know that Kaiorama um, is looking at expanding Kaiorama to where you are at the moment. And uh, so, to give you an idea, that program was only uh, given the green light in 2016, in January 2016. They run it in the first, uh, in, in 2016, that year, and uh, now they're up to <sighs> lots of cohorts across the country, eh? lots and lots, way more than expected, so we had to put the cap, uh, cap on it um, for now, but uh, now it's going to grow. So just give the body one on the while, I know you're going to be a I know that for your is also running, there's no such thing as competition when it comes to this thing, it's about cooperation and collaboration, and um, that's what we're doing as well, so uh, it's a whole new way of education, so uh, so give anybody or any of these uh, put a call, and they'll help you out. Um, I'm just wondering how, in your, in your experience on taking on this um, lifestyle, how did it work for your employment, and, and I assume your wahine is like this as well, so yeah, so she's really bound and it causes a whole lot of problems. So she I'm the she's the Maori of our relationship and I'm the Maramataka one in our relationship more than anything. She's always asking me, Oh, what's the day today? Oh geez, you should learn it's on the toilet wall. Um <laughs> Anyway, so with regards to the cafe though, what I notice is quite often there'll be, I guess I probably am the one that acts in that way a bit more and certain days I'm ready for action in the morning and other days I'm just kicking back. And so it affects her in a way that quite often um, a lot of people will get hoha because she'll be late. You know, people will be there, supposed to open at 8.30, you're not there. Or not even, some days we don't even open the cafe. And um, people will get really hoha because of the fact that this is, what they were planning on doing. And so it's a conflict with their worldview as well. But living in Murupara, most people are in touch with nature in Murupara in some way or another. And so that doesn't affect it too much from our community perspective. And with regards to my mahi, um, my mahi works on a, like I'll be, could be teaching on the evening, could be doing weekend, noho, all sorts of things. So it's really flexible time-wise. And so it actually works really easily. And so I, um, can only give great credit to having that opportunity to be able to do that because in most situations it's really difficult. Yeah. How long does your course run? The Kaioranga. The one that's Yeah. Yep. Starts in September and goes through till middle of next year. So it's sort of following a growing season. What day is it today on the bottom of the river? Um, for me, I'm in one of those extended periods at the moment that runs through at the um, Tamatea through to the Rako phases and so it seems like it's dragged out an extra day and I'm still in Ohua. So it's yeah. not Ohu, oh, Oturu. No. Oturu in my calendar and I've seen this differently too so don't say, it's, I'd, I'd hate to say that it's wrong but within the Maramataka I follow Oturu is the absolute full moon and that's the day before the moon arises on the horizon. This one bro, today is actually Yeah, yeah. And so that one, we're not in Hokianga Harbour at the moment, so I'd say, and we're not in Murupara at the moment, so I'd say that we're, it's right, of course it's right. Yeah. yeah that, that's yeah. one of my mothers, well, how well worked it out, what it is here. Yeah, so that's why I say that connection to places. Got a date. Got a